Hey Chris, that's Swiss Air 127. He had a UFO or a rocket, something almost hit him in my airspace. Military radar advises they are picking up an intermittent primary target behind you in trail. Since the earliest years of manned flight, pilots and astronauts from around the world have encountered UFOs high in our skies and beyond. This is Houston. Say again, seven. Now, many of their dramatic cockpit recordings, film clips, and stories have been made available for the first time. The UFO? <laughs> it's the Roswell crap again. UFO reports that we get from professional pilots are considered among the very best because of their knowledge of the sky. From never-before-released black box and control tower recordings of commercial airline flights... Last year, Julie, you still see uh, traffic out there? Hell yeah. For the FAA, UFOs are real. They've been punishing pilots and covering up UFO reports for over 50 years. To never before seen astronaut reports and secret recordings in outer space. We have an unidentified flying object. Many of NASA's top astronauts have already testified to seeing UFOs. As astronauts and pilots around the world report ever increasing levels of unusual activity in our skies. Big bright light on the front and a greenish tail coming out the back. I'll tell you what, that is weird. And the military doesn't have to anything flying tonight. It was too fast to be an airplane. It looks like a UFO. Many wonder, do the skies belong to us or to them? The report that was made last November 17th of a UFO spotted over Alaska attracted special attention. This sighting was made by an airline pilot with 29 years of experience. The crew claims that while it was flying over Alaska last November, it was followed for 400 miles by strange white, yellow, and amber light. Of the thousands of reported pilot encounters with UFOs around the world, few are more harrowing than the episode on the 17th of November 1986 involving Japanese Airlines Flight 1628, high above the Alaskan tundra. Regarding uh, uh, airline cases uh, in, uh, in America, the GL is very interesting because you have multiple witnesses. It was a cargo aircraft and the pilots uh, observed an object that seemed to be tracking along with their aircraft. It involved an investigation by the FAA. This is an official government investigation of the sighting itself. The events of that night were captured on tape. Then there's 1628 heavy military radar advises they are picking up an intermittent primary target behind you in trail. In trail, I say again. The Boeing 747 cargo jet was on a routine flight from Paris to Tokyo, cruising at 600 miles per hour at an altitude of 35,000 feet. It was headed towards Anchorage, Alaska to refuel. Suddenly at 5.11 p.m., Captain Kenju Terauchi, a pilot with 29 years flight experience, saw three large, fast-moving, unidentified objects 2,000 feet below. The largest object was described by Captain Terauchi as resembling a shelled walnut. Captain Terauchi said that the main craft was twice the size of an American aircraft carrier. Co-pilot said it was as solid there as if you were seeing an oncoming jet with its lights on, except it wasn't an oncoming jet. 747 was nothing compared to this uh, big flying saucer. After several minutes of observing the UFOs, the pilots realized that the objects were now matching their speed, 600 miles an hour, and tracking them. The captain reported that the objects began, quote, making moves that are impossible for any man-made aircraft to perform. Then, without warning, two of the smaller craft suddenly rose and shot directly in front of the pilot's window. The objects came so close to the aeroplane that Captain Terauchi recalled that the intense glow made his face feel warm. All of a sudden they appear and they're traveling right in front of the aircraft. And they were sort of wobbling back and forth as they moved. They seemed to be only a, a thousand, maybe two thousand feet in front of the aircraft and traveling at six hundred and some miles an hour. At that very moment, their radio link to Anchorage went dead, leaving the aircraft flying blind. A horrifying catastrophe was seconds away when the UFOs rose and veered left. Uh, quite a big, uh, like a home 
In his official FAA report, Captain Terauchi said we had to get away from that object. Defender 1628, sir, do you still have the traffic? Uh, disappear, Defender 1628, I understand you do not see the traffic any longer. I'm good. Moments later, an urgent message came in from Elmendorf Air Force Base. The unidentified object had now appeared on their radar. Yeah, there's one dash two again. We have confirmed there is a flight size of two around your 1550 squad. One primary return only. Okay, where is he following him? It looks like he is, yes. Okay, stand by. The phrase flight size of two indicated that JAL 1628 had uninvited guests, possibly with hostile intentions. Immediately after this confirmation, the FAA requested that the Air Force scramble jets. Do you have anybody to scramble up there, or do you want to do that? Oh, we're going to talk to your liaison officer about that. It's starting to concern of uh, Japan Airlines taking the 360 now, and it's still falling. Okay, we're going to set, we'll call the military desk on this. Although the military desk took no action, JAL 1628 landed safely in Anchorage at 6.20 p.m. Extensive media coverage around the world has helped make this incident one of the most widely reported UFO cases in history. The JAL case continues to inspire debate about the nature and intent of the objects that tracked the 747. To this day, it remains a mystery. The Japan Airlines 747 had a saucer go around it. The papers mysteriously disappeared from the FAA office. The 30th of January, 1987. Only two months after the JAL report, a similar UFO event took place in Alaskan skies. But this one involved the US military. A US Air Force KC-135, flying from Elmendorf Air Base in Anchorage to Eielson Air Force Base near Fairbanks, reported a chilling UFO-related incident at 20,000 feet. The pilots reported that the object was strikingly similar to the UFO seen by the JAL flight, a massive, disc-shaped, noiseless object larger than an aircraft carrier. Seconds later, Anchorage Air Traffic Control asked whether the KC-135 still had the object in sight. The pilot replied yes, and added that the object was now only 40 feet from his aircraft. The recent incident involving JAL Flight 1628 even came up in their cockpit recording. Thirty minutes later, the Anchorage control tower passed on a message from the local FAA office. Actor uh, 29, the quality assurance staff at the Anchorage Center here requests you give them a call after you land at Eielson. That is it, concerning the uh, object we're looking at. Affirmative, sir. I think pilots make especially good UFO witnesses. They know what's normal in the sky and what isn't. Uh, they've seen all different kinds of airplanes routinely. When a pilot reports a UFO, there's a better than average chance that that's what it was. The 31st of January, 1987. Less than 24 hours after the KC-135 encounter, yet another UFO-related incident occurred in the skies above Alaska. The pilots aboard Alaska Airlines Flight 53 witnessed enormous, bright, disc-like objects tracking their aeroplane. Ground control stated that no object was visible on radar, but it was the speed of the UFO craft that alarmed the pilots. They had just underneath our radar picked up a blip. He's moving about a mile a second. Just pull out straight ahead of us and just disappear. Man, he was there and then he was gone. If you're a pilot and you report a UFO sighting to the FAA, you might as well turn in your license the next day. The FAA, the military, even civilian authorities don't want to know about UFOs. The first pilot encounters with UFOs took place in the 1920s and 1930s, long before black box and control tower recordings were possible. Sightings by pilots have occurred ever since the very beginning with Kenneth Arnold. 
Kenneth Arnold was uh, flying from Chehalis, uh, Washington, over towards Idaho. Somewhere around Mount Rainier, he uh, identified what looked to him to be about nine aircraft traveling in an east to west position. It was this man, Kenneth Arnold, from Boise in Idaho, who ushered in the era of the flying saucer. At this point is where I had this terrific flash. I looked way off here to the north, and that's when I saw where the flash came from. It was a, an echelon formation of a very peculiar looking aircraft. The second craft from the rear had a more or less crescent shape. And of course I kept mulling in my mind, that's the damnedest looking airplane I ever saw. Upon landing in Yakima, Washington on the 24th of June, 1947, Arnold made what would become the first civilian report of UFOs to the US government. He described the objects to reporters as appearing and moving like saucers skipping across the water. Somebody else twisted that around into the term flying saucer. That was the beginning of it. His official report, made to American Joint Army and Air Force Intelligence, is seen here for the first time. Arnold described the UFOs as thin, round in the front, and coming to a point in the back, and not appearing to whirl or spin. He watched the craft flip and flash in the sun, and commented that the more I observed these objects, the more upset I became, as I am accustomed and familiar with most all objects flying. The Arnold case was extremely significant in that prior to it, there had been no talk publicly about disc-shaped shiny objects flying around. And we haven't been without UFOs or flying saucers ever since. Coming up, the skies above New England are rocked by three separate UFO encounters, all captured on tape. They got anything flying out in the area? Negative one of the turned over. All the night had a couple of UFO reports. The Grand Canyon is a graveyard for 128 passengers and crew of two airliners which collided in a thunderstorm and crashed on peaks little more than a mile apart. The impact reduced the wreckage to carbonized smears of paint and metal. None survived. It was the worst commercial air disaster in history. Some experimental black box and pilot voice recorders were used by the military during the Second World War. But it was not until a catastrophic mid-air collision in 1956 that onboard recording boxes were made mandatory by America's Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA. A major accident above Grand Canyon imposed the FAA and the NTSB to ask for all the airlines to be equipped with audio recording system. Since the mandate of cockpit voice recorders, hundreds of reports have been made of strange lights, near-miss collisions, and radar tracking of unidentified flying objects. Three recent pilot recordings captured over the United States are presented here for the first time. One of the most fascinating cases is Lufthansa 405 out of JFK, November 18th, 1995, where they saw a UFO across Long Island. The 18th of November, 1995. While flying over Long Island, New York, Lufthansa Flight 405, traveling from New York en route to Frankfurt, made a disturbing call to Boston Air Traffic Control. The pilots reported an unidentified flying object passing within 3,000 feet of their plane. It should be uh, on our tail about 10 minutes. Uh, we passed it just uh, one minute ago and it was looking straight. The UFO was described as a long cylindrical object with a white light on the front and a long green comet tail. The strange UFO was also seen by British Airways Flight 226, a 747 flying from London that was just north of the object. The code name for British Airways flights is Speedbird. It actually worked up at opposite traffic to those of the above. It did have a, a very strong vapor trail which looked more like smoke, and the light on the front was very, very bright. And on terms of 405, how far off your side did that traffic pass? It was pretty close, and uh, like the Speedbird said, it was looked like four or three thousand feet above on the left wing, just one mile, looked like a UFO. Boston Air Traffic Control contacted Giant Killer, the US military fleet area control and surveillance facility that monitors restricted airspace over the Northeast. Giant Killer, they got anything flying out in the area? Negative one of the turned over. All the night it's had a couple of UFO reports. 
I had a couple of guys that uh, reported uh, lights just went all over their head. I had no tra no traffic whatsoever in the area. They, they said a pass within a mile of them, like a two thirty thousand feet above them, opposite direction. Oh, oh, it could have been a meteor or something. Hmm. No, we don't have any aircraft out there. Both pilots confirm the object has glowing lights. The object has a green vapor trail, not like any vapor trail they've ever seen. Both pilots immediately questioned the idea that the UFO they had seen was a meteor. Well, that's a 405, so you, you would say that it definitely wasn't a meteorite. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. Alright, let's do a 286 now. It could have been a meteorite because uh, it was flying level. It looked as if it was going very quickly. It definitely looked faster than normal aircraft. It was uh, cruising in a straight line and at one level flight. Number 226, thank you. We're looking into it. I mean, uh, we're, we're making a report. We really don't know what it was. And the military doesn't admit to anything flying tonight. While the authenticity of this recording is not in question, the FAA and the airlines have never commented on this mysterious incident. Two years later, Boston would be the epicenter of another strange encounter between pilots and UFOs. But this time, the encounter would involve a near-miss collision. The incident was captured on tape by the aircraft's black box recorder. The 9th of August, 1997. Swiss Air Flight 127 was a jumbo jet en route to Zurich. Pilot Philip Bobe and First Officer Kurt Grunder were at the controls. At 23,000 feet, Bobe would later report that his visibility was excellent with no haze and a clear blue sky. Suddenly, an unidentified craft entered the plane's airspace. The pilot immediately contacted Boston Air Traffic Control. Sister 127, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. I don't know what it was, but it, it just overflew like, like a couple of hundred feet above us. I don't know if it was a rocket or whatever, but incredibly fast, uh, opposite direction. It was too fast to be an airplane. Later, in his official report, Bobe described the UFO as a bright, white, cylindrical object with no wings, resembling a white shark. Aviation writer Don Berliner filed a Freedom of Information Act request to obtain the FAA audio and written records of this incident. The Swiss Air case is significant because the object that was described is quite unusual and the people reporting it have excellent credentials. These are veteran airline pilots. Moments later, the Boston Control Tower contacted another sector operator who was about to take over the flight. Hey Chris, uh, Swiss Air 127, he had a UFO or a rocket, something almost hit him in my airspace. A uh, UF yeah, UFO or a rocket almost yeah, hit the Swiss Air 127? Went, went right above him, two, about two or three hundred feet. The pilot's official incident report classified the object as a UFO. However, the National Transportation Safety Board and the FAA concluded that the object seen by Swiss Air 127 was a weather balloon launched by the military at about the same time. These are not the kind of people who would be fooled by weather balloons because these are uh, fairly common experiences among airline pilots. It's really hard to mistake a weather balloon for much of anything else. These strange encounters with UFOs are not limited to the northeastern United States. Sightings of UFOs by pilots have been reported across America. On the 28th of February, 1996, the skies over the Midwest were rocked by simultaneous reports of frightening aeroplane-like objects moving at incredible speeds. This case involved two commercial aircraft, Air Shuttle 5959 en route to Cleveland and Masaba 3179, a Dash 8 headed from Detroit to Pelston, Michigan. The event was recorded by the Cleveland Tower. Gets a report from an air shuttle flight coming out of Detroit that they've picked up a strange light very close to them. Nobody can figure out what the light is. Hey, Cleveland is so 59, We see traffic out there uh, 12 to 1 o'clock, a uh, lower altitude. Do you, do you have them here? Air Shuttle 5959, that's a negative, sir. I don't have anything out in front of you. Can you get an estimate on an altitude on him? So we're in between layers here. I'm just going to estimate a 2,000 feet below us, maybe, and uh, so sort of pulsating right about, I don't know, 10 miles out. Is that northwest of Detroit? Did you see that light? Yeah. yeah that's what I saw, a real bright white light, sometimes flickered uh, underneath the clouds. Two reports from two separate aircraft 
and both pilots had described the same bright, pulsating light between the cloud layers. Cleveland Air Traffic Control questioned whether the light might be a landing beacon. Air Shuttle 5959, is that traffic uh, that you saw earlier, do you see him out there any longer? Air Shuttle 5959, uh, that's permanent. I don't know if we'll get closer to it or what, but it looks like a rotating light around it, uh, like a frisbee type thing that's going around it. Well, Sabah 3179, do you see the same thing? Uh, sir, I saw it coming out of Detroit. I wondered, uh, all I saw was just a couple real bright flashes of light, but it looked like it was underneath the cloud deck to me, maybe 10,000 feet. Well, would you think it might be like a reflection, uh, maybe perhaps off a beacon that for some reason is just one of those weird things, uh, natural phenomena that uh, you're getting a reflection? Because I got nothing out there. It's definitely a distinct whitish, uh, well, they're looking a little red and greenish light, sort of pulsating, and it is consonant. It's not a beacon. The Cleveland Air Shuttle hangs a Yui, goes under the light, and now is looking at the light from underneath and says, absolutely not, Cleveland. We are seeing the light above us, probably at 5,000 feet. And Cleveland Air Shuttle 5959. Just to keep it advised, uh, we're descending to 4,000 feet right now, and as we descend it through 10,000 feet, that object is above us right now. It is not on the ground. It's about 10,000 feet. I'll tell you what, that is weird. It's just sitting there pulsating. I'm trying to do a little investigating as to what this might be, and if you would keep me advised on this. Okay, sir, I'm going to point my lights at him and see if I can get any reaction on him. Masaba 3179, when you flashed your lights, did you get any response? It appeared to, sir. Okay. A double pilot sighting caught on radio that you would never hear because the media never covered it. Coming up, another UFO double sighting. This one involving an America West airliner and NORAD. This guy definitely saw it run all the way down the side of the airplane. It's right out of uh, the X-Files. And we'll analyze evidence of UFO sightings during NASA's Apollo moon missions. On the 25th of May, 1995, an exceptional UFO-related event occurred more than seven miles above Earth. An enormous, fast-moving UFO was witnessed by an America West airline crew. What made this incident a watershed in black box recordings was that it was one of the first on record to involve a US government agency, NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command. This uh, 1995 uh, America West Airlines case, the government got involved briefly. Somebody with air traffic control told the crew, one of the crew members, that they had been in touch with NORAD, which had briefly confirmed radar tracking of something in the area, and then later denied it. The Air Force confirmed that there was an object, and especially the NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, yeah, we detect something. America West Flight 564 was flying from Tampa, Florida, to Las Vegas, Nevada. Captain Eugene Tollefson and First Officer John Waller were in control, cruising at 39,000 feet above Bovina, Texas. Everything was normal until 10.25 p.m., when the pilot spotted a UFO just below them at 30,000 feet. We have obtained the actual recording of exchanges between Albuquerque Air Traffic Control, Flight 564, and NORAD. Okay, Captain Smith, 64, say again. There's nothing on their radars on the other centers at all on that uh, particular area, that object that's up in the air. Uh, it's up in the air? A permanent. What's the altitude about? I don't know, probably right around 30,000 or so, and it's uh, there's a drill that starts from going uh, counterclockwise, and uh, the length is unbelievable. The pulsating object was reportedly over 400 feet long yet invisible on radar. This prompted air traffic control to contact nearby Cannon Air Force Base radar operations in Clovis, New Mexico. Cannon, go ahead. Hey, guy at 39,000 says he sees something at 30,000 that the, the length is unbelievable and it has a strobe on it. Uh-huh. This is not good. <laughs> okay. uh, what, what does that mean? I don't know. It's a UFO or something. It's that Roswell crap again. The crew that saw it described it as a long, thin object, cylindrical with a series of lights down the side, blinking on and off in sequence. They saw a cigar-shaped object 
flying with strobing lights on a length of uh, uh, roughly 300 feet, which is quite big. Seconds later, an Air Force F-117A Nighthawk from the 49th Fighter Wing at Holloman Air Force Base was alerted by air traffic control. The stealth fighter saw something. RK-5, in the next two to three minutes, be looking off to your right side. If you see anything about 30,000 feet, one aircraft reported uh, something. It wasn't a weather balloon or anything. It was a long, um, white-looking thing with a strobe on it. Let me know if you see anything out there. You got any traffic off our left wing right now? Uh, I've got some passing off here at 9 o'clock and about uh, 12 at 31 westbound. Okay, so we'll take that from about uh, a little lower than us just went off our left wing. The Nighthawk reported an object passing off its left wing. America West 564 had the same experience moments later. The object moved dangerously close to both aircraft. The anxious America West crew contacted Albuquerque Air Traffic Control again. The object suddenly disappeared from Flight 564's view. Then a concerned Albuquerque Air Traffic Control contacted NORAD's Western Air Defense Sector Headquarters at McCord Air Force Base in Tacoma, Washington. I've got a, uh, something unusual, and I was wondering if you all happen to know of anything going on out here. I had a couple of aircraft reported something 300 to 400 foot long, cylindrical in shape with a strobe oh. at 30,000 feet. We don't have anything going on yeah. that I know of. This, this guy definitely saw it run all the way down the side of the airplane. It's right out of uh, the X-Files. I mean, it's a, it's a definite UFO or something like that. I, but, I mean, and, and, oh, y'all are serious about this. Yeah, he's real serious about it, too. And uh, he looked at it, saw it. Holy. 13 minutes later, Albuquerque Air Traffic Control checked in again with NORAD. Only this time, NORAD had something. We had someone call here earlier about a pilot uh, spotting an unidentified flying object. Yep, that's us. Okay, well, hey, we're tracking a, a search-only track kind of up where that might have happened. We, um, we've been tracking it for about three, four minutes now. According to the official report, NORAD has denied this incident in writing. These were experienced airline pilots. They'd been flying thousands of hours. They were familiar with the sky. When they say something, you have to pay more attention to it. A Melbourne, Australia television reporter said his crew filmed UFOs for seven minutes Saturday night over the eastern region of New Zealand's South Island. On the 21st of December, 1978, cargo plane pilots John Randall and Keith Hine observed strange light phenomena over the sea near the South Island of New Zealand. The objects were also picked up by Wellington air traffic control radar and reports reached local media. Ten days later, on the 31st of December, producers at Australia's Channel 10 dispatched reporter Quentin Fogarty with a camera crew to attempt to find the same UFOs along the same flight path. And they did. Air traffic controllers were recording strange blips on their radar. Here is what reporter Quentin Fugarty said as he traced an airline flight that reported seeing UFOs last month. We're now in the radar room at Christchurch Airport. It's about uh, quarter to two, and in about another 20 minutes, uh, we intend to take off again in the Argos Sea and uh, retrace the route we took only a few moments earlier. Uh, we've just heard from Wellington radar that there are still targets in the Kaikoura area. So this time we're hoping to get better film than we did last time, and. Uh, all I can say is we'll see what happens. The New Zealand case is of considerable importance in the history of ufology because of the residue of information that's available afterwards. We have the film itself and the tape recordings made by Quentin Fogarty on the aircraft. And of prime importance is we have the tape recording made by the Wellington Air Traffic Control Center. And it provides a history of the sighting minute by minute. 
We're about now three minutes out of Christchurch Airport and on our starboard side we can see two very bright lights, one much brighter than the other. It is like a very, very bright star and just below it is another light not quite so bright. Just before midnight, Fogarty went airborne with cargo pilot Bill Startup. The beginning of the flight was uneventful. Then at 12.05, Fogarty and the crew saw strange lights and objects coming towards them from the right side of the plane. Fogarty turned on his camera and they began filming. Those two lights appear to be traveling with us. They're still off the starboard wing. The brighter light is still above the other and uh, it's moved a little further ahead of the other. It was extremely bright, much brighter than any of the other stars in the sky. Ground radar observed the objects and the control tower confirmed the sighting and recorded the conversation. What follows is the actual audio of this unusually well-documented event. The storm target is showing at uh, 11 o'clock at 3 miles. And the door is at 9 o'clock. Just left at 9 o'clock at 3 miles. Captain Startup said that the object, or target, was initially ahead of him, then travelled at an unbelievable speed past his left side. He quickly banked the plane left in an attempt to make visual contact. From the ground, Wellington air traffic radioed a chilling message to the captain. They had picked up yet another target on his left side, and this one was closing in on the plane. I'm now looking over towards the right of the aircraft, and we have an object confirmed by Wellington Radar. It's been following us for quite a while. It's about four miles away, and it looks like a very faint star, but then it emits a very bright white green light. Captain Startup was able to get close enough to determine that the object had an array of bright blue lights pulsing at a rapid rate. To his shock, the object had increased in size. There was an interesting radar event where the uh, object, some object got so close to the aircraft that looked to Wellington radar as if the aircraft radar target image had doubled in size. Strong target, uh, right in formation with you now. Uh, your target has doubled in size. The double sized target continued to appear on radar screens for 36 seconds, then returned to its original size. Yeah, blue light's right there. This is the object which was uh, apparently traveling along with the aircraft. It was picked up on aircraft radar. Dr. Bruce McAbee received a 16 millimeter copy of the Argosy UFO film directly from the Australian television network in 1979. Roll four, take 10. The complete and unedited film has never been made available before. Experts believe that these images are the most comprehensive and frightening UFO evidence ever captured on film. This is the famous New Zealand film obtained uh, the night of December 31st, 1978. The cameraman is sitting in the seat between the pilot and the co-pilot with the images dancing around because he was carrying it on his shoulder. They saw this light to their right. And this light, as time goes on, will fade in and out, takes on various shapes. This is the flashing light that you have to slow down and look at frame by frame to see what happens. When he goes from very bright white down to dim orange, you can see the image went over to the side, then he turned the camera a little bit in order to pull it back into the center. That uh, other target that has been following us has now been joined by two others, so we now, at this stage, have uh, three unidentified flying objects just off our right wing, and they've been following us, or one of them has been following us now for probably about 10 minutes. One. I'm hoping really that uh, we've seen enough the night and uh, the rest of our journey back to Berlin will be uneventful. I think I've just about had enough of UFOs for one night. And that's the way it is. Or is it? Monday, January 1st, 1979. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. Pilot sightings of UFOs are not exclusive to Earth's atmosphere. In the early 1960s, as America and the Soviet Union escalated the space race, astronauts and cosmonauts began to witness strange and unexplained objects and events in outer space. You know, in 1958, when NASA formed, they 
literally expected to make contact with extraterrestrial life. The 4th of December, 1965. Four hours and 24 minutes into their historic 14-day mission, the astronauts of Gemini 7, Frank Borman and James Lovell, both military test pilots, were performing routine tasks. Suddenly, at 2234 Greenwich Mean Time, with the capsule high above Hawaii, both men saw a bright object, or bogey, flying above their capsule. Borman radioed mission control in Houston. What follows are the actual audio transmissions. Last clear. Seven, go ahead. I'm talking with 10 o'clock high. This is Houston. Say again, seven. I'm talking with 10 o'clock high. The recording ends suddenly. NASA insisted that the sighting was Gemini's Titan booster rocket. Lovell replied that he could see the booster as well as, quote, several actual sightings. I remember hearing this on my car radio, talked to NASA, and they confirmed that uh, that was the phrase used, we have a bogey in sight. In NASA's official Gemini 7 mission report, published in January 1966, no mention was made of the infamous bogey recording. Neither Lovell nor Borman have ever commented publicly on this subject. But as far as the American public is concerned, NASA denies the very existence of UFOs they've been covering up since the dawn of spaceflight. From the early years of the US space program, NASA was beset with sighting reports from astronauts. The 13th of September, 1966, Gemini 11 astronauts Richard Gordon and Charles Pete Conrad saw something strange on their 16th revolution of Earth, 27 hours and 47 minutes after liftoff. Conrad radioed ground control. He reported that he had just seen an unidentified object about 50 miles downrange. It was metallic and revolving at more than one revolution per second. He pulled out a camera and took three photographs. The object dropped down in front of them before quickly disappearing. These are the actual photographs taken by Conrad aboard Gemini 11. And NORAD said that the only thing that they could imagine it was, was a booster from a Russian satellite. The NASA people threw out the NORAD explanation almost immediately. The Gemini 11 case is the only one that NASA considers to be unidentified. Gemini 11, however, was not the last NASA mission to have alleged encounters with UFOs. In fact, more and more UFO sightings were reported as Gemini gave way to the Apollo program. The Apollo astronauts in particular were trailed by UFOs. It is alleged that Neil Armstrong, you know, saw UFOs. That many of the astronauts did, but they won't talk about it publicly yet, but they might. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. The famous Apollo 11 mission allegedly experienced objects tracking the capsule, as well as objects that were photographed by the astronauts on the moon's surface. Four months later, on the 14th of November 1969, Apollo 12 commander Pete Conrad reported to NASA that he had seen an unidentified object from his window. An object which is at the same place all the time but appears to be tumbling. Well, we've had it ever since yesterday. It just seems to be tagging along with us. While the object was widely thought to be debris falling from the booster, many researchers remain skeptical. They suggest that debris would be incapable of tracking a fast-moving space capsule for an extended period of time. As the Apollo missions opened the door to the space shuttle program, experts were convinced the door had also been opened to an increased level of UFO activity in outer space. In 1981, NASA initiated the space shuttle program. With it came an unprecedented wave of UFO sightings, including astounding audio and video evidence. One highly controversial recording emerged from STS-29, a space shuttle discovery flight on the 13th of March, 1989. Astronaut John Blaha reported sighting something unusual. One of the NASA transmissions that wasn't successfully sanitized back in 1989 one of the astronauts on a space shuttle said, we're still looking at the aliens. It was as plain as day. 
The following recording was reportedly intercepted by an amateur radio operator in Maryland. To this day, NASA has neither confirmed nor denied the validity of this transmission. The space shuttle has two radio channels. One is a public channel that we all hear when NASA is broadcasting. We can hear what the astronauts are saying. The other channel is a Department of Defense encrypted channel. And that's where I believe the real conversations are going on. The new millennium ushered in more UFO sightings by NASA shuttle crews. This extraordinary recording is from Space Shuttle Flight STS-73. Mission Specialist Catherine Coleman saw something curious on day three of the 15-day mission. This is October 21st, 1995. We have an unidentified flying object. And nothing after. I mean, there she is. Catherine's just floating around in there. And that's where I believe they went on to the Department of Defense encrypted channel on the space shuttle, and they continued the conversation. Researcher David Sereda has been studying unusual phenomena in outer space for over a decade. His theory is that NASA continued recording, but on a secret frequency, leaving us with more questions than answers. We have an unidentified flying object. Even recent shuttle missions have had eerie reports and sightings of strange objects. According to Sereda, more shocking evidence of UFOs in outer space came on the 6th of August 2005 from Space Shuttle Flight STS-114. Well, the space shuttle is doing 18,000 miles an hour around the Earth. So the object is traveling obviously much faster than 18,000 miles an hour to catch up to the shuttle to fly in tandem speed with it, and then it takes off and goes back out the other way. And this is real footage from the space shuttle. Even considering that it may be just a few miles away from the space shuttle, it's obviously a, a very large UFO. The object appeared quickly, dramatically changed speed and direction, then flew back out of frame. The trajectory and speed of the object seemed to defy the laws of physics, leaving researchers like Sereda to draw their own conclusions. When you zoom in on video frames or any digital media, you get pixelation. So some of the rectangular shapes you see are pixels, but notice also you can see the round aura of light around it. So you can still differentiate shapes within the pixels. There's no way that's dust and debris. There's no way it's another satellite. When you go through process of elimination, you know that what we're seeing in STS-114 is truly a UFO. There's really nothing else out there like that. Since NASA does not comment on the topic of UFOs, the authenticity of space recordings and sightings cannot be officially confirmed. This leaves many questions unanswered. UFOs constantly trailed our spaceships around planet Earth the space shuttle, but more importantly, all the Apollo, the Project Apollo spacecraft on the way to the moon. I think a lot of astronauts are gonna start coming forward and testifying to what they have seen. My impression is that the guys who go running around saying the NASA stuff proves something are hyping it. As Earth's airspace becomes increasingly crowded and more people than ever take to the skies, is it possible that reports of strange encounters will continue? There are reams and reams of official reports by commercial aircraft, by private aircraft, and military aircraft about pilot encounters. Even if, while we're sitting right here in California, a UFO turned up over Santa Monica Bay, you probably hear a great explanation of how it was a reflection of the sun behind the cloud. There have been many reports from many experienced pilots of strange phenomena and frightening encounters with UFOs since the beginning of manned flight. As our pilots fly through Earth's atmosphere and further into space, we continue to wonder, do the skies belong to us or to them? 3179, we got a passenger taking a picture of it right now. Looks like a UFO.